Well, hello everyone, and welcome to the Court International Festival of Literature. Uh, today, I'm going to be interviewing uh, Brian Washington from all the way from America. And um, um, I'm my name is Paul McVeigh. I'm uh, here in Belfast, and um, I'd like to tell you uh, a little bit about Brian. And it's quite impressive. So I hope you have a little cup of tea. Um, sit down, relax, and listen to this uh, amazing CV. Uh, Brian Washington is a writer from Houston. His fiction and essays have appeared in the New York Times, the New York Times Magazine, the New Yorker, Vulture, the Paris Review, GQ. He um, is a National Book Foundation 5 Under, five, five under 35 winner, a New York Public Library Young Lions Award recipient, an Ernest J. Gaines Award recipient, an International Dylan Thomas Prize recipient, and uh, I think it's Lambda Literary Award recipient to Penn Robert. It basically goes on to be the most intimidating CV that I have read in a long time. Um, he's currently a writer in resident in uh, at Rice University. On Memorial itself, which is what we're talking about today, his debut novel, um, uh, the New York Times called it a notable book of 2020. And um, it's it was nominated for the National Book Critics Circle Award for Fiction, the Aspen Literary Prize, the Andrew Carnegie Medal of Excellence, the Center of Fiction's 2020 First Novel Prize. I mean, wow, Brian. I mean, how does that feel to have all the success and critical praise being heaped upon your debut novel? It's all a bit much, <laughs> you know, it's, at some point it's just like, okay, yes. you know, but it's, it's a, it is a warm feeling uh, to, you know, to see that folks have found some points of connection within the novel. And, you know, it's more, it's more than I feel like anyone can reasonably hope for at that point. And of course, and it wasn't like this was your first success because although it's your debut novel, your debut collection I was like not that long before and um and it also was winning awards all over the show and i, I know because i had judged the dylan thomas prize i think the year before and um so i would keep up with them and i know you won the dylan thomas and so i i actually contacted them because i was really hoping that maybe you just weren't a very nice person because it would make it easier for me to just just dislike you and um you know because of all these awards and you know confirm my jealousy was based on truth uh, and and dislike, but they were all really, you know, praising you and saying how lovely you were and and how amazing you were and how amazing the book is. And I I'm now because I've loved Memorial, I've now bought lots. So that's uh, that's what I'll be next. And um, and by the way, I, I was up to five in the morning uh, finishing this. Uh, oh, wow. So you know, completely hooked. So um, with lot, just go, just so we can give you a bit of um. Uh, sort of chronology. Um, so you you have a love for the short story, clearly, and as I as I do. And I just wanted to ask you: was were you writing the novel the whole time, sort of on the on, in the back in the background of that, so while you were publishing these short stories, or was it more of a case that you were cutting your teeth and on the short story mm. before you launched into the novel writing? It was very much the latter, you know? I mean, I feel like I very much would not have been able to write Memorial, both technically and thematically, if I hadn't had the experience of working through the stories of Lot. Uh, most of the stories of Lot were written well before I had an inkling of what I thought Memorial could look like conceptually and also you know, the idea of a novel or a novel on the project was like deeply, is still deeply daunting to me, but was uh, significantly more daunting to me at the time. So I think a lot of it really stemmed from realizing many of the questions that I had in the midst of writing a lot were limitless in many ways, you know, and they could be extended into a longer form work. Uh, questions of what is a home and what happens when home changes? Is home like a physical place or is it a collection of memories? Is it a series of contacts? And what happens when the context in which you find yourself shifts and, you know, you're sort of left to yourself to identify yourself, you know, to sort of uh, come to terms with what you might actually want in lieu of what someone has told you that you're meant to want or what you, you know, you should want. So some of those questions were present in a lot, but I wasn't, I don't think, fluent enough or just I don't think that I had the technical acumen to 
see them to fruition in the way that I wanted to try to attempt to do for Memorial. So uh, one, one would not, the latter would not have been possible without the former. Hmm. I, I often say, you know, I, I have some stories on my uh, computer that have been, that have been there for about 10 years, you know, and I, and I, and I just can't, finish, can't get them right. And I, I keep saying, you know, I'm waiting for my ability to, to match my intention, you know, and I'm, I'm just not good enough yet to write that story. Mm-hmm. You know, I just have, there's something else I've got to learn and I'm not sure what it is. And, and what I, I did notice, because I was, you know, obviously I was reading around your book and reading reviews and some interviews and, 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 and there's a sort of consensus that is wonderful and it's fantastic it, that lot was that, that, that Memorial is a step forward, that there, there is a growth. And uh, have, did you feel that in your writing? Mm, that's a really good question. I mean, I think that that's always the hope, you know, that's always the ideal scenario that you are progressing in some form or fashion, like stagnation in many ways is, you know, uh, not what, you know, is is the ultimate aim is. But I, I think that for me, or at least the way that I conceptualize it is, am I getting closer to, if not answering those sort of questions that are circling around me, developing them and furthering whatever tangent of the conversation that I might find myself in at the time of my beginning a particular narrative, right? Like where have those questions that I initially found myself with, where are they ultimately taking me? And I feel like if I've, if I've reached a sort of terminal end of my curiosity in one plane or another, then that is, you know, it's a failure in many ways for, you know, a project, right? Like I, I'm not... I'm not particularly interested in coming to hard conclusions and I'm certainly not interested in, you know, prescribing a way to be or not, whether it was for a lot and these sort of questions of what is a neighborhood, what is a community or for memorial so much as like, how, how does one just, how can you just be a person in the world? You know, these are questions that, uh, you know, there are as many answers as there are people and, you know, threefold over really. But um, it, it felt like I was furthering a conversation that I was having with myself more so than a progression for me. Although, of course, it's really lovely when folks say that they think that you're getting better at what you're doing. Um, I I felt that I, I just something chimed with me I, when you were just talking about home there, as I'm I'm still winning on uh, for my, the pleasure of the, for the pleasure reading lot. Um, when you were talking about it, it was about an expiration of, of lot. And uh, about home and in those stories, and and I suddenly recalled a passage in um, a, in Memorial where you would where um, he go Michael goes to Japan, and there's this kind of little speech about um, you know how he, he should be feeling at home because he's gone back home, but it's not really his home because he lives in the U.S. and that's home, and then you know and this kind of huge. You're, when you're someone who's moved away, you know, I lived in, went and lived in London for 20 years, whatever, you know, I still refer to London as my home, but I'm now back home living in Belfast. There's that mm. when you're sort of the immigrant as, as well. And that whole idea, I was an I moved to London and I was Irish, but was I Northern Irish or Irish or English or British? Or, and that confusion becomes part of your tapestry, doesn't it? I mean, Mm-hmm. That very much so yeah mm-hmm. and you There's find tension your, there yeah your characters then act out of that space mm-hmm. very much i mean i think that these questions of where do i belong i mean you know they, these are you know, perennial questions that have been there long before you know you or i will be hopefully you know be circulating uh, long long after you know we're, we're done telling our stories and so it, it feels like uh it's very much a challenge, you know, to take that question and to, if not tell it anew, then tell it with your certain slant or tell it with your certain bent, you know? So it's something I feel like is circulating for Mike and Benson respectively, but also in very singular ways, you know, because I wanted to write a text in which many different things could be true simultaneously. And that was cert- intent was certainly there for a lot, but it really calcified itself over the process of writing Memorial. Like I wanted it to be a narrative in which it could be true that a character like Mike, who's, you know, Japanese American, queer, cis male, 
is able to find the closest iteration of home that he's been privy to in a neighborhood like Houston's Third Ward, which is one of the U.S.'s oldest historically black neighborhoods for Mike to feel as if he's a part of this place and that there's a symbiotic relationship between him and the place and for residents to also feel that he's a part of this particular place. I wanted to write a book in which that could be true. And also to write a text in which it could be true that a character like Ben, who is black, queer, cis male, finds the closest iteration of home that he's ever really been privy to in Mitsuko, who is uh, Mike's mom, who's this much older Japanese-American woman who's come from a very different time, a very different way of life in many respects, but they're able to find something akin to a family in one another. Um, Writing a text in which both of these realities could exist simultaneously without negating one another or really even pushing or pulling on one another too far uh, one way or the other was something that seemed challenging to me because it's not divorced from reality as I've experienced it. You know, like if I were to come across someone like Mike or someone like Ben, who has this particular relationship with Mitsuko in Houston, then I w- it wouldn't warrant a second glance for me because it's, you know, having grown up in this particular city, it's, it's, uh, it's very common. But putting it on the page and trying to extract a narrative from it pr- presented a really interesting challenge because I feel like part of what warrants it as being common is because of the many underlying contexts that have accumulated for me and I imagine for most Houstonians or many Houstonians as a result of having lived here for a time. So the question for me became, how can I tell this narrative so that a reader or an audience who perhaps hasn't been privy to these many, many, many different underlying contexts or these many, many, many different um, influences by way of the city directly can sit with the story and intuit it and have it read as natural and have it read as if though these are, you know, actual people who are just living their lives, which is always the challenge. Um, So this question of where is someone meant to be as opposed to where they think they're meant to be um, is, uh, you know, it's an overlying tension. And while the the question was certainly prominent for me, I I wasn't interested in answering it so much as just allowing, you know, the characters to be dynamic and to have autonomy and to have the benefit of the doubt as they try to negotiate it on their own terms. Yeah, I was, when I, when I started reading uh, Memorial, I was, um, uh, quite shocked initially when I looked at this relationship because I, I sort of thought, I, I initially was thinking, you know, why are these people together? What on earth, what on earth are they doing? And, and then, and then he, you know, so they're sort of, a, they're an estranged couple and it, you know, you're, you're right but you're thinking, okay, this is, this is not good. They're, 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 this can't last. I mean, and if it's, I can't believe it's lasted this long. I mean, but it, it does. And then, and then they become geographically estranged. And um, when Michael goes to um, visit his sick father, help a sick father in Japan, um, leaving his mother, who's just arrived to visit, with his lover that he's who he's having a really terrible time with, in the same apartment. And I just thought, oh my god, if someone did that to me, I'd bloody kill them, you know. And I so I'm thinking, you know, this this relationship. I'm like, oh my god. And but by the end of it, it to me, it was like. It was like a love story in reverse, you know? I, I kind of, by the end of it, I went, oh, okay, now I get now I get how these people are together and why and why they've persevered and how how these things happen. And I wonder, if, was, was that your intention? Was it this to engineer this kind of uh, gradual understanding and sort of almost rooting for this relationship at the beginning that you're really quite, really not? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, thank you for that. But yeah, that was very much the intention, and it proved immediately to be a challenging one. You know, both thematically and technically. I knew that in order to pull off the thing that I wanted to do, you know, to tell this love story that in many ways you, we we don't really get the love of the story until much later on in the story itself. That there would have to have equal credence between both of the narrators, right? Like I knew that if I was trying to build this relationship between two people, it wouldn't feel natural to me, at least, if both 
parties weren't given their due um, narratively. So from the very outset, I knew I wanted to get as close as possible to matching the exact word counts of Mike and Ben. And I think that Ben ultimately gets, yeah, he gets like 1,100 more words than Mike, but that's only because I wasn't good enough to get it one-to-one. And that felt really important to me because I wanted readers to have these different vantage points for each of the characters, but also to spend time in the same moments as each of these characters from various vantage points so that we're seeing different corners of observations, that we're seeing different corners of memories and in building this more comprehensive view of what their relationship ultimately entails and how it unfolds and how they are individually and how they are together. I felt like I could have a, if not a larger than a significantly more detailed portrait of what not only their relationship was, but also what it could be. So that when Mike and Ben do end up in the same place, the challenge for me became less trying to say, okay, this is who Mike is and this is who Ben is and this is why they're away from one another than reinforcing that in fact, you know, they could make it work you know um i wanted to tell a story in which the question wasn't whether or not mike and ben were in love with one another or whether they had love for one another i wanted that to be an implicit yes like from the very outset of the narrative but the question and the challenge for me became what happens when these two young men who do have love for one another and in many ways, various ways, but in many ways are in love with one another, don't have the language for that love or aren't able to articulate that love and aren't able to manifest that love in such a way that they're both able to share it and that they're both able to come to terms with what exactly they need from one another in this particular relationship. So that was that was really challenging to develop for each of the characters, but I thought it would be something that was interesting to read, you know? I mean, I think that a recurring idea, a recurring theme for me was, you know, just talking amongst friends, this idea of how as a young queer person, like you're constantly cobbling together these many different ideas of what is a relationship, right? Like what are the many forms that my wants can take? Like what do I want? What are my desires? And how do I fill that liminal space between what I want and what a potential partner wants? Like where do we meet in the middle despite having so such a dearth of models for the many different ways to be. So in writing, you know, a love story between Mike and Ben, it became clear to me pretty quickly that I was also essentially going to have to write a narrative in which both Mike and Ben individually have to find out how to be, just like how to be as a person, as individual people, so that when they came back to one another, they had a keener sense of who they were just individually. And from there, they could figure out who they were in relation to one another. So it was a really tricky thing to, you know, to, to just figure out on the page. But once that, you know, manifested itself as the thing that I needed to try to do, things became, uh, if not easier, then a bit more streamlined. Yeah, I mean, I and I think it, and I think you really, I really got that, I really got that feeling that I took that journey with them. And I, I, and I think I, you know, I, I had those sort of frustrating moments that you do when you're watching sort of stuff that you're or, or reading stuff that you're you're emotionally involved in, or you become emotionally involved in, or you when you find out you're emotionally involved and you didn't realize it until someone does, and you go, "Why are you doing that? You know, what are you do? Why are you sub sabotaging yourself like that? I mean, and you're getting yourself and you're getting yourself, and you think, "Oh God, I really care about this now, don't I? Right? Okay, I, I'm in." And it is it, there is something incredibly frustrating about watching, you know, someone's mess up and and uh, not articulate because you know what they want are they are you are there's an implicit sense of what they want on, and and yet they're they're just going about it all the wrong ways and and of course it's a great device isn't it for for a, for a writer and a reader you know yeah. to become to form, to form that relationship with the reader then isn't it between between you two that that this is what you're doing to me and and I, and, and and it gives a trust and a and a frustra- and a pleasure, but a, a frustration as well. Uh, that was lovely. 
Yeah, it's it certainly because I, I like that, you know, that feeling. Of, I mean, and, and that's what I and I wonder if it's the same for you, but like that's what I seek out in the art that I hold dear and the art that I return to, you know, texts and films that have created that relationship, push and pull between the text itself and the body of art itself and the reader. So the question for me wasn't really do I need to create investment or do I need to create a relationship so much as how do I create that relationship and that investment between the story and these characters characters and the reader themselves and sometimes that meant creating moments between Mike and Ben just individually and together of a complete and utter lack of self-awareness you know having the the moments where Ben says I would never be in that situation in the midst of being in a disastrous situation or Mike saying oh that's not that's something I would never do and then have him not do that thing but he does something that is equally catastrophic on his own end and you know just just putting uh the reader in the position of seeing that okay like as as, as, as disastrous as this, this this is and you know the many different ways that you know these two individuals are very different they you know they're, they're alike and they are a sort of match uh in in, in other ways uh, so, so trying to create that relationship and trying to create that investment is something that's I, f- I feel like that's perennial you know i feel like it's like an essential thing but um if it's pulled off and you know when it's pulled off, it, it, it makes me hold a, a work of art or like a piece uh, very close. Yeah, yeah. And would you like to read a little bit for us? Because um, I'd love to hear it in your accent and, um, as, and, and, and your voice, but particularly your accent as well. I think it just brings something extra to the, to the page and, and, and I can go back and read after, after speaking, listening to you as well, just to uh, sort of see how it looks. Yeah, yeah, I can read a little bit. Um, It's near the beginning, so you don't really need much context if you haven't read it before. But uh, the speaker is Benson, and he's found himself staying with his uh, maybe partner's mother. Yeah. The next morning, for the very first time, Mike's mother knocks on my door. She's fully dressed while leaning on the doorway in a tank top and boxers, and she says, take your time. Jesus Christ. We leave five minutes later. Our black neighbors wave from their porch. There's a question on the grandfather's face, and I wonder if he'll ask it. But Mitsuko doesn't look away. If anything, she walks slower, staring him down. Mike's car is filthy with clothes, or hoodies and socks and a loose pair of shoes. The whole thing smells like him, and I know his mother smells it too. When I toss a pair of shorts behind us, she grunts, and there's a jock strap in the back seat, and I pray to no god in particular that Mitsuko doesn't spot it. We pulled out of the neighborhood and into town when she says, You're sure they'll have what I need? They should, I say. You and Mike make the same things. Maybe similar, says Mitsuko. Not same. We drive through the mix of locals beginning their day. Whole swaths of Houston look like chunks of other countries. There are potholes beside gourmet bakeries, beside taquerias, beside noodle bars, copied and pasted onto a graying landscape. At a stoplight, these two smiling guys walk a toddler across the stream, holding the little girl's hands on either side. One of the men is white, the other one's brown. They look like something straight out of Outsmart. I glance at Mitsuko, and her face doesn't tell me much. So, she says, you're black. You notice, I say. Just barely, says Mitsuko. And how did you find my son? Accidentally, I say. Let me guess, says Mitsuko, it was Grinder. It wasn't. You found my son on the internet. No. We met at a get-together, I say. An acquaintance introduced us. Sure, says Mitsuko. Once the couple crosses the road, their daughter looks up at them, beaming. She is the happiest that a child has ever been, ever. If Mike had seen them, he'd feign some sort of choking, or he'd honk his horn, or he'd go sober, not saying very much at all. Thank you very much. Lovely. Lovely. Yeah. Like, so, and I'm going to, I'll have your voice now when I read Lot as well. <laughs> 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 I'm a from here. Um, <laughs> um, so, when it's, can I just say, it's Mi- Mitsuko? Is that, is that mm-hmm, how I Mitsuko. pronounce her? Mm-hmm. She's one of those characters, and I and I look. I don't know if this is a gay thing, so I I know I can say this to you uh, as a fellow as a fellow uh, member of the, our fraternity. Um, but it is um, is 
she's like one of those characters that gay men love, you know, she's like really hard work, you know, she's hard work and she's ballsy and she says exactly what's on her mind and um, she can be vicious with her tongue. And for some reason, we really want to be their friends. And we, we, we know that we probably in real life would find her incredibly difficult, but on paper or on screen, we just adore her and we just think she's, you know, so we sort of really sort of root for her, even though technically she's not, she's really hard. She's really hard work, isn't she? I mean. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, I knew that, I feel like I knew three things from the outset of the novel. The first was that, you know, the story would oscillate between Ben's vantage point and Mike's vantage point. I knew that I had a pretty clear sense of where the narrative would end up and that it would be challenging to get there and make it work. But I also knew that Mitsuko in many ways would be the heart of the novel. And if her character wasn't executed to a certain degree, then it just wouldn't work because Ben and Mike are very seldom, just as far as page count is concerned, in the same place at the same time in the present. So in many ways, she's the bridge between the two of them as they currently are and in the midst of their trying to become who they believe that they should be. And Mitsuko is a character, I think, that in many ways is tricky for both of them to interact with, both Ben and Mike, because they're two people who are respectively very challenged when it comes to saying what they actually want or what they actually feel. And they mask it under a myriad of things, whether that is just just being difficult, whether that is through food and cooking for one another, or whether that's through the the many different other ways that they find to communicate around the thing that they would actually to communicate. But Mitsuko is incredibly direct. She's incredibly straightforward. She's incredibly honest and she does it from a place of love like constantly you know and i think that that is yeah yeah and i I think that that is what makes her presence so challenging and in many ways so life-changing for benson and mike specifically and respectively you know i mean the the very first thing that she does upon re-entering the states and being told that you know, by her son, you know, you're not going to be staying with me. Actually, you know, you're going to be staying with my maybe partner for an indefinite period of time because I'm going to be returning to Japan to meet uh, your not husband. And also, you know, he doesn't speak Japanese. Um, there are many different ways that I feel like a person could <laughs> react to uh, that, that series of developments. But the very first thing that she does for Ben upon Mike's leaving the country is cooking a meal and to create an even keel between the two of them. And that's a recurring motif over the course of their relationship in the midst of her telling him that, you know, you're a bullshitter, right? Like you're full of shit. Like, you know, you know, you know you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong, you're doing the other thing. She's constantly creating that even keel and providing comfort, uh, creating a home for them, essentially. And that is a challenging friction for Benson, like a character who has not experienced either those sort of direct statements or that direct show of love, you know, and it is love and, and, you know, although a a difficult form and, you know, probably a less transparent form for Benson specifically, and much of the novel is him realizing that love and appreciation and care probably more specifically can take a number of different forms and trying to identify what care means to him in the same way that Mike is, although in a very different respect, uh, it has to identify like what care means to him. And Mitsuko is the character that is, you know, providing it in so many different ways. And she's really not able to speak freely of her own experiences and her own history and her own vantage point until, you know, at the end of the novel, when she's at, you know, this tiny little Tex-Mex restaurant and she's finally being cared for. She's finally being serviced and she's able to tell her story in a way that she hasn't prior because she hasn't been in a position where she has been, you know, situated in the person that is being cared for, you know? So her character was challenging, but I knew that, you know, there, there, there would have to be a certain 
level of care with that particular relationship. I mean, partly because of the, you know, the thing of like gay boys and their moms and the sort of recurring narrative, but partly because like she, you know, she's one of the most honest characters in the narrative. And that is an honesty that um, provokes and, and, and challenges and, you know, brings out a lot in all the characters that surround her. And I think that, you know, we, when, when we meet a character like that, or when we are forced into a dynamic with a character like that, whether it's a teacher, I had one, who is like that, you end up, it's sort of like they're, it is a, they're, they're issuing you a challenge, really, to kind of meet them somewhere. Like they see what it is that you are not giving and, and they challenge you to come and meet their expectations of, of, of how one should be. And, and you, you try to please them. You do try to meet them. You do try to please them despite yourself. Um, it's almost like something you can't even control this desire to please this person who's, who appears displeased. <laughs> and, um, yes, and then, and then it's, it's so, <laughs> exactly. so rewarding, isn't it? So it's so rewarding at the end. You know, I thought that was one of the most rewarding bits in the book for me when she sort of winks over at him, like, you know, oh. you did good. And I was like, oh, oh, we've been waiting. He's been sort of almost waiting for that. You know, it's such a fulfilling moment, I think. And very cinematic, actually. And I, I, I felt that moment. I could just see that rousing, you know, at the end of a, of a movie, that sort of beautiful moment. And um, I... I had read an interview uh, with you where you had said that um, movies, film was your early narrative experience and teacher. And that I just went, yes, of course that, you know, that, that I can see that. Mm. And, um, and I wondered um, are other um, for you clear examples of that uh, teaching in, in Memorial, you know, how that it can see a thread going from that narrative detail. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, uh, and I probably should should preface it by saying that I mean, as far as you know, probably authors or specifically or like writers more generally in my cohort, I probably uh, as a teen read less than you know you, you, it, it would be hard to convey like how much of a non-reader that i was but i was really fortunate in that you know the you know the, the city that i lived in i had immediate and uh pretty consistent access to a myriad of what for the states were foreign films so i was able to build um a, a language um around narrative and a language around like the weight that a narrative can hold and i mean different ways that a narrative could be told through that and there are you know tiny things that I think that ultimately became the, the things that I really um, I really focus on when I'm working on a draft, whether it's something like a physical proximity um, that characters have to one another and, you know, finding myself turning back to a film like Weekend or finding myself turning back to a film like Spa Night in which the characters, the, the relationships that their bodies have and what they aren't saying, but how they're moving around one another is just as important as what they actually are saying through their dialogue or the placement of objects around a room or the way in which a character's actions, a sort of unspoken dialogue that they're having has an outsized effect on their behavior. So thinking of a film like uh, Hirokazu Koryeda is like still walking, right? Um, in which you have characters that are doing many different things on the screen working in tandem with one another and it doesn't have an immediate relationship to what they're talking about but th those actions taken in tandem with their dialogue make the scene like they don't one can't exist without the other um but there's a film called uh, Yi by Edward Yank um, that I was I was really lucky to see, you know, when I was very young, and I and had many different run-ins with that particular uh, film over the course of like my narrative education. That proved to be essential and at the heart of like how I, you know, conceive of what a story can do because it was a it was a film that you know really reinforced to me and showed me that there are many different ways to have conflict in a narrative right and it doesn't necessarily have to be a bank robbery right like an explosion doesn't necessarily connote to conflict like conflict can be the proximity of people in relation to one another or conflict can simply be the passage of time and the ways that people change over that passage of time. It doesn't have to be um, the loudest thing in order to have like an extremely 
prominent resonance emotionally and quite a lot of weight for a reader or the audience. So returning to, you know, the films that have meant a good deal to me and just really studying like how they're able to accomplish the narrative moments and the narrative movements that they do and how they're able to elicit the film, the the feelings and the emotion for me after having seen them, you know, fucking like 30, 40, 50 times, like still feeling that emotional weight has been deeply educational and I could really only be grateful for having had the ability and the opportunity to have these resources uh, for, you know, my sort of narrative lexicon as it developed. Yeah. I mean, um, I have a theater background and of course, you know, the same, that a same idea that we, you, you it, when you can use dialogue to uh, play with what's not said all the time, because you yes. don't have these you know, exposition paragraphs where you're describing everything or telling you know, the secret thoughts of someone, you know? So, mm-hmm. it, and, and, and another thing I was thinking about, um, not only that, I was thinking about my, you know, were this whole um, theme of the unsaid that runs all the way through Memorial, uh, th- these characters who are unable to articulate that's one way that the things aren't unsaid, but there's many, there are many ways that things aren't said. And I thought also actually then it reminded me of the short story form, you know, um, because mm. that, that that really is, you know, it's the Hemingway, isn't it? You know, it's sort of like, it's just the tenth of the iceberg above the water sort of thing, but it really is true, you know, and you see it much more in short stories than you do in novels because of that expanse of a novel, you've got all that time to tell everybody what <laughs> What's exactly going on? And we sort of almost expect it, you know, because well, what else is he going to put there? Um, he's not going to just tell us what's going on. So I wondered whether there was a whether there was a line there from from that as well, from your short story writing, taking it into the novel. I wondered. I wondered. Yeah, there, there was a. That was probably one of the more prominent lines for me like and and then it's it's a recurring challenge for me like that friction between what a character is actually saying what they actually mean and why there's friction between those two entities or why there's distance between those two entities you know i mean oftentimes that is where like conflict can reside in a narrative or conflict can reside in a story, at least from my conception of it, right? Like, why can't this character say the thing that they want or why can't they say the thing that they mean or why is there such tangible and palpable distance between what a character thinks that they want or they think that they need, but they they actually don't uh, want or need that thing or the thing that they want or that they need um, is actually the bad thing, right? Like what happens when a character actually wants and needs that that bad thing? What if the bad thing is actually good for a character or vice versa? So that was, you know, th- those are questions and those were, you know, tiny little math problems for me that, that made themselves visible over the course of writing Lot. And Lot, in many ways, was a series of exercises for me of playing with these questions of what happens when, you know, a character exits the context in which they're comfortable in order to find the thing that they want, right? Or what happens when they realize that the thing that they want or the thing that they need exists many different contexts down the line so that they become ultimately the bad thing. But that is what allows them comfort, right? Or that is what gives them pleasure, you know? And seeing that, you know, these these questions and, you know, the sort of the rhythms that they created were limitless in many ways was, was really helpful when it came time to actually work through the novel and particularly when the, the novel became extremely difficult, like knowing that there, there isn't actually an answer to these questions, right? There isn't a hard prescription. Like there are any, many, any number of ways um, that they could go. Um, just having that as like a refrain for me was, was, was uh, deeply edifying when, when it came time to trying to figure out, okay, like what does this mean for Mike uh, specifically? Or what does this mean for Benson specifically? You know, like a character like Ben, who in many ways his arc is becoming someone who can exist on his own and is comfortable with himself and knows what he wants and knows that he can can leave this particular relationship, but still finds himself drawn to this relationship. I mean, because it, it felt like a, it felt like a massive growth for a character to realize that they didn't need 
another person. Like they didn't need this relationship to be and to feel comfortable, but to still find themselves wanting to be with that person. I mean, that that becomes a very active thing and trying to figure out how to make that work on the page was just as tricky as for Mike's scenario, a character who ultimately learns, albeit roughly, to intuit the desires of the folks around them and to intuit their wants and their respective needs and to have those take precedence over his own or what he feels that they should want or what he feels that they should need and to want to provide pleasure and to want to provide comfort. Um, Those are massive shifts, I feel like, for a person to make respectively over any given period of time. Um, but they're, they're really subtle shifts and they, they can be, uh, they, they can be really poorly executed if, you know, you show your hand too quickly or you show it too often. So, um, the unsaid and the unspoken is constantly something that I'm trying to work on and to sort of work towards so that that narrative of what is absent on the page is just as loud and just as uh, present as what I'm actually putting on the page because I think it creates that it further further develops and further hardens that relationship between the uh, reader the audience and you know the, the work or the piece because if they can see the thing that I'm not saying and they're able to see that it, it's playing just as prominent as a role as the, the stories it's developing on the page um, I think it, it makes you it creates more investment and it makes you want to be there and see if that unsaid thing will ultimately be said or not yeah it's sort of like if there's a gap we fill it don't we and you know and mm-hmm. i think yeah, that yeah. what's interesting is that you know um what's really interesting in that dynamic if we think about it then is because not only are these two characters um not telling us what's happening and it's but you're not telling us the re the, the author is not telling us the reader and that's that's a beautiful sort of mirroring there isn't there and actually to, then i just i just remembered actually there's that lovely line towards the end where um uh mitsu i know i'm gonna say that wrong Mitsu, and she's she, she, she's recounting the story and she, she and um and she's and and, and she, she's sort of saying you know but you know why didn't you tell me you know you know you would have saved me getting hurt i think she says and and the reply is you know but you know there's there, there's some things you just got to find out for yourself you know mm-hmm. and that's almost the mm-hmm. the the story of the book isn't it you know that the, that's what we're talking about there's there's some things that you know that that the that the um, the pleasure and the importance on me really has to be about you finding, figuring out why I've left these gaps and what and what was what I'm saying in them under the under these words and in those absences, you know. So it's quite beautiful sort of symmetry, I think, as well with the with the end with that coming out at the end. Just just mm-hmm. so I noticed yeah. that. Just no, saying. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. And it felt like a big risk, you know. I mean, it, it felt like a like a massive risk in a lot of ways because if you don't see it, then you don't see it. But then the challenge for me as the author and as a person telling the story is to make this invisible thing within the grasp of the reader and to create and craft it and to sort of structure things so that it is, you know, it, it is there for for the reader to see, you know. So it became a it became a, a big challenge, and there were more reasons not to do it than to do it. I think, but it ultimately, you know, it was the sort of thing that I felt that I would want to read and that I would quite enjoy if it was pulled off at a certain level of execution. So that became the bar, right? Like, how do I write this? How do I structure this in the sort of way that like I myself would enjoy it and just sort of let things fall or go from there? And of course, and I am I'm aware that in lots of uh, literature festivals, there are a lot of writers come along because they're, they're, they're fascinated to hear about the processes and, you know, and that's, that's the sort of, um, a great piece of advice really you know write the book that you want to write and that you'd want to read rather than try to write to some sort of idea or markets or what you think was it was a was number one bestseller last year or or what you think people want and trying to second guess um that mm-hmm. and um and 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 that and i remember you talked on that and it's something i i think it was, was you said something like um you you'd written memorial thinking um the four people would read it on their phone. Was that right? <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 even that I think may have been generous, but yeah, that's right. It was, it was, cause it is a, it is a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, it tracked and it coded as a tricky 
book to condense into a sentence and a half or so, which sort of breaks uh, many of uh, American publishing sort of cardinal rules. Like, who is this for? What is it? Um, you know, why is this person telling this particular story? But to write a narrative that felt as expansive and as messy and as dynamic and potentially as open-ended as any number of relationships could be felt as if though I would have to play with the form. I would have to play with the structure. I would have to play with a sense of what is possible. I'd have to play with the geography, allowing characters to go where they wanted to go and to exist in many different contexts in order to find out the things that they needed to figure out. Um, that, you know, it just, it plays back into that idea from Toni Morrison. It was like writing the narrative that you yourself would enjoy, you know, writing the book that you wanted to like see out in the world. And while I wasn't, uh, I, I cannot emphasize strongly enough that I had no idea that uh, this would be something more interesting to me and maybe, you know, a handful of my friends. I did know that like if it was executed in a certain way, I would be really interested in it. And, uh, you know, my I, when I showed it to my friends, they, they were also similarly interested in it. And from there, um, you know, I could only be grateful where it's gone. But, you know, that was uh, ultimately the primary goal is like how do i do justice to the best version of this particular story that i could possibly uh do i noticed a few things with that because about the sort of form of the book i mean okay so we have um the dual narratives um you know coming the story coming from two perspectives of our of our, our main protagonist and then um, uh, then also that um, the, it's sort of like a novel in flash, you know, that there's sort of these moments that just come, um, oh, this is the first time we did this. I remember the second time. I remember uh, when we first that night. And, and, and so you're, you're, you're getting it like a memories are coming to someone um rather than this sort of like uh chronological story and 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 the other one of the things i i noticed was that well i i don't i was trying to remember if i a, a novel in recent years that i in fact not even recent years i'm, I'm quite old um I've, I've, I've many many novels i'd read with with um photographs just suddenly coming into mm. the text i was like what what's going on here i thought and and, and you know and i think mm. maybe i'd certainly i remember twice it maybe three times but you know just just a couple of times and and i thought what was that I mean was that your idea and what and if so what, i mean how did that come about yeah it was, it was it was my idea i was really fortunate in that you know when i pitched it to my editor she didn't just absolutely dunk on me and then you know when we pitched it to the production team they didn't absolutely dunk on us everyone was extremely supportive but it it stemmed from this question of like how do two people you know namely mike and ben who just <laughs> simply do not know what it takes to communicate with one another like how do they communicate because they do in fact have to communicate in some capacity or another so you know they, they cook for one another um they they, they have sex uh they uh, they text one another and they send one another photos so trying to play with the many different means of communication at their disposal when they weren't quite able to communicate what they wanted to communicate felt important to me. And so Mike sends photos oftentimes that he hopes the tone of which or the ambiance of which will convey like a certain mood or a certain emotion in the way that he himself isn't able to articulate one way or the other. And Benson will do the same or they'll text one another and that'll operate as a shorthand for the things that they perhaps aren't able to say face to face to one another or over the phone with one another. I mean, in, in some ways it felt intellectually dishonest and not emotionally dishonest not to utilize text and not to utilize these different means of communication that these two folks would have at their disposal you know particularly um you know because they're so geographically spaced apart over the course of like most of the novel but it felt like a very natural thing you know and it felt like again you know there's some, something i thought would be interesting like i i'm always interested in um the idea of a book is like an object, you know, and uh, once the opportunity, you know, made it so once it became clear that, okay, this is something that would be possible, like I would be able to do it and my publisher was on board with it, the question just became, how 
can I do it in such a way that it's not, you know, just like a hokey or just like a waste of like the reader's time, you know? So it started with uh, roughly 200 ish photos or so. And that cut down to a hundred that cut down to 50. And then um, my editor and I from there just sort of thought, went through and uh, just talked through like, okay, what, why, what does it mean that this one is here? What does it mean that this one is here? Um, what's their relationship to one another and what's their relationship to what Ben and Mike are actually saying or not saying to one another. So really trying to be strategic and thoughtful about it uh, became uh, the goal after it became clear that, okay, this is something that might be interesting. Yeah, and um, I think uh, just, I know we're coming to the end now, actually, and I, I have one question that I really want to ask you, and particularly because I'm about, I, I, I'm about to go into a lot, which I hear is, all, um, has has a lot a lot to do with uh, community and um, you know that that's definitely a memorial. I mean, this sense of community and one of the things I that really struck me and um, that I thought you did just just did so well because it was done so subtly and, and so organically um, that 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 I, I that I don't I guess if people didn't know this world that you're describing um which i think is a world of, of po almost kind of borderline poverty you know s you know working class areas you know where you're in the middle of something incredibly intimate and um and private in your own home mm. and then you know, you're interrupted by the neighbors leaving next door and then suddenly speaking outside your window or hearing these and they're, they're just such there's such just just done so beautifully and subtly and and that that your community is outside but it, it comes in as well and 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 every time they go out there's a comment about who's waving over or asking them something or who he sees talking at the oh. you know or you know and 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 um there's i mean it's it's so it's, it's so well done and i and i do you know do you think am, am i go barking up the wrong tree here do you think this is about class as well this sense of community you know, because, um, you know, it's because you're living so close together and it's because the walls are so thin, because there's so many of you crammed in mm -hmm. to one space. I don't know. I... Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think that it would be impossible for me to divorce the idea of class and economic advantage or disadvantage from this idea of what a community is or what it can be or how oftentimes the same geographic spaces can be radically different things to one person or another depending on their level of privilege their level of economic advantage or disadvantage or level of sort of sanctified like education by one entity or another so it felt and feels important you know it felt uh deeply important as far as Lot was concerned, because in many ways that was conceived of as a series of ghost stories of it for a certain narrative for certain parts of towns that were in the midst of significant and ongoing transformation. I mean, uh, the maybe wild thing about Lot is that, you know, at the time of my writing many of those initial short stories, the neighborhoods depicted were in the midst of widespread and sort of deep, extremely quick uh, gentrification. And at the time of publication, um, very few of the neighborhoods depicted were as they were at the beginning of my writing them. So the book in you know a very strange way becomes a series of ghost stories about ghost towns, about places that are still there, but that are radically different. Um, the, that question of what is a community and what is a family and what happens when you know those family lines extend beyond blood when they um include your co-workers when they include a bar's patrons when they include your neighbors were extremely important for me as far as memorial is concerned largely because Mike and Ben, in many ways, are in the midst of trying to figure out, like, what as 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 much as important as the question of like who they are individually is, or the question of like how they relate to one another, how do they relate to their families, what family is, and how do they relate to the context in which they find themselves is just as prominent, or it felt just as prominent for me. And a city like Houston, that is, you know, one of the most diverse, if not the most diverse, uh, uh, cities in the states. I mean, it it would have taken away from the narrative not to bring the world as they experienced it and the world as it shifted from context to context into both Mike and Benson's respective 
expectations, but also conceptions of what a community is or what a community can and could be, you know, and also how big and how much of an import the world outside of them has on their conceptions of themselves, you know? I mean, they're able to see who they are and what they want as it's refracted off of the folks around them in many ways. And sometimes that refraction creates um, turbulence, you know? Sometimes that refraction creates many different veils, right? As they move from place to place, perhaps uh, what they're seeing of themselves and other people is not actually how they conceive of as themselves. And it's only when they find themselves separated um, in Mike's case, uh, you know, very, very, very far away from their point of origin that they're able to see like, okay, this is actually what I want, or this is actually who I am, or this is actually how I want to relate to other folks. Or in Benson's case, you know, in the very same place, but the, the shift of context and finding himself surrounded by new and different people shows him a clear image of himself. Um, I think that, you know, that this idea of what a community is, what like a home is, what a family is, they're all interconnected, you know? I mean, in, in, the, in the same way that I feel like in uh, contemporary US fiction, it's you very seldom find fiction about marginalized groups. So you very sex- seldom find fiction about poor people more specifically, that isn't solely capitalizing on their trauma, you know, that isn't solely capitalizing on their disadvantagement so that that becomes like the point of their narrative. But in wanting to write a story in which many different things can be true, I felt like it would be emotionally dishonest not to tell a story in which you have a character like Ben that does experience many racist microaggressions, that is HIV positive, that does live in a historically economically disadvantaged part of town. And he also has loves and he also has things that makes him laugh he has things he likes to eat he has you know fears you know he has all these many different things that make him a person and they all exist simultaneously in tandem with one another uh trying to write a narrative that was as emblematic of life as it actually can be lived as it was depicted on the page was you know it is a lofty goal for anyone to take but those are the narratives that i most drawn to um, the narratives that are able to you know create people on the page and create communities on the page and the many different things that they can entail well well done and um congratulations on a fantastic book and um i really loved it and um i uh, we've come to the end of our interview and thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today And everyone's going to love it and they're going to love you as well because you are sort of adorable. Um, and I think when they find, when they come to read your book, they're going to feel after today that they've really understood, you know, w- what's happening. And and I think anyway, and, and not to an extent they'll forget all about all that because they'll just follow the story and they'll become so emotionally uh-huh. caught up. Um, and um, and here it is again, it's uh, Memorial and the collection of short stories is a lot, which I'm about to start. And um, please do go to the Charlie Byrne um, bookshop online um, where there's a special section for all the authors uh, in, in the festival. And um, so please do go and have a look on there and do buy them from there. I'm looking forward to reading them. I did have some um, really nice notes to how to close out, but I threw them away with gay abandon uh, because they were on my, <laughs> for some reason in the midst of, uh, in the midst of this we were there and I'm not going to try and figure out which ones they were. So I hope I cover everything by thanking you very much, by telling them to go to um, the Burn Bookshop and buy your books. And I also say, um, and if you enjoyed the, the um, this um, event today, please do check out all the rest of the events in the festival. And if you felt the need or the desire to contribute to the festival, please do. So you can find it in the core um, IEF um, website and uh, please do that. So, Brian, thank you all very much again. Oh my God, thank uh, you so much, Paul. (laughs) Thank you so much. It's been great. It's a delight to meet you.